Um, give it another minute until we uh, until we start properly, just so people have got that time to stretch their legs, have their lunch, and then we'll jump in with some introductions. So one more minute to go. If you need to grab that coffee, please do. I'll do that chore. We've got some lovely, lovely people joining us this afternoon. I can see Amanda Kirby and Hope Kent, who are our next speakers. Fantastic. Great to have you here. And I've got my cats going bonkers in the background. So um, apologies if you can hear noise. <laughs> it's the glories of working at home, isn't it? Which we've all learned these last two years. <laughs> if we didn't know before. <laughs> all right. OK, so it is 12.30. Um, I think we will we'll kick off gently. Um, so just to introduce myself, my name's Morwenna Stewart. Very good afternoon to you. I work with Charlotte Valor at the Institute of Neurodiversity. I manage the UK part of the charity. We're a, a very young startup charity, but we've got big plans. Um, and part of the part of today is um, that's part of our big plan is to have these these kinds of events um, with many wonderful, wonderful partners that we work with. So um, I am moderating and introducing people today. So this afternoon, we also wanted to just kind of give a bit of a intro to the conference overall, just in case anybody is joining us for the first time today. And that's to kind of give a bit of a background, which is to say that the conference is aiming to be aiming to start a strengths based conversation about neurodiversity and the criminal justice system. That's which has been a, a little bit lacking. Our core objectives for the whole conference are to bring these interested people together to share knowledge and exchange ideas, to give a platform for interested people to listen to and learn from each other, to give a safe and inclusive space for people to explore the area of neurodiversity from a strengths based perspective. Our conference organisers have had an inclusive approach to speaker inclusion and sought to involve all people interested in presenting wherever possible. So with that bit out of the way, I will introduce our first two speakers. We have got, I, I was going to say they need no introduction, but I'm going to give an introduction anyway. Um, Professor Amanda Kirby. Amanda is an emeritus professor at the University of South Wales and an honorary professor at Cardiff University. She has clinical and research experience and she founded and ran a transdisciplinary clinical and research team for 20 years relating to neurodiversity. She's written nine books and more than 100 research papers in the field, and her latest book published in 2021 was entitled Neurodiversity at Work, Drive Innovation, Performance and Productivity with a Neurodiverse Workforce. Amanda's a qualified GP and she has a PhD relating to emerging adulthood and neurodiversity. She is the chair of the ADHD Foundation and works closely with many other charities in this area. She's worked in the justice sector for more than 15 years. She's also the CEO of Do It Solutions or Do IT, capital IT Solutions, a tech for good company that's developed biopsychosocial accessible tools. I could not say that after a glass of wine to support people in and out of the justice sector. It has been currently used in 24 prisons. Amanda has lived experience as she sees herself as being neurodivergent, as well as being a parent of neurodivergent children and grandchildren. So that's Professor Amanda, and I'll introduce her in a minute. And we also joined today by Hope Kent. Hope is a PhD student supervised by Professor Hugh William Williams at the University of Exeter. She studies psychology and quantitative methods and is an Alan Turing Institute enrichment scholar. Her current research aims to understand how neurodisabilities impact children and young people at risk of school exclusion and contact with the criminal justice system. She's a member of the Neurodisability and Law Enforcement GLEPHA, G-L-E-P-H-A, Special Interest Group, and the UK ABIF, um, Criminal Justice Acquired Brain Injury Interest Group. She's also the UK Policy and Research Director for PINK, P-I-N-K, Concussions, and advocates for improved care for women in prisons who are often victims of domestic violence. So some really amazing credentials there. So very big welcome to Amanda and, and Hope. I will pass over to you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Could you just give me the, the potential to share the screen, please, if that's possible? I think that's probably with our organisers, isn't it? Hopefully they will do that magic yeah. behind the yeah. scenes. Is that happening? Wonderful. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Just waiting. Thank you very much for the introduction, Morana. And um, I'm just waiting for that to come up and happen. Um, nothing happening yet. Have you not got the permission yet, Amanda? No. Ah, no. Oh, so who have we got? I'll organise this. I think it's Beth or Emily. Are you able to make sure that Amanda can do, do I try that? To just try there now. Ah, oh, lovely. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Yep, perfect. There's always that anxious moment before you start sharing your screen. Um, okay, so let me. So good morning, everybody. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're doing this as a sort of presentation in two halves, and running. We've got too much information in too short a time. We're going to try and cover quite a lot. Um, so we're talking this, this afternoon about neurodiversity and adversity and interwoven pathway. And as much as Morwen is saying about strengths, what I'm really keen to is why do we miss people? Where are they going? Why can't we identify those strengths and, and give people equal opportunities to be successful? And when, what's happening in the, the prison system? So I'm going to in, start introducing the background to this and then hand over to Hope, who's going to present some data that we've been looking at to, that's going to exemplify really about the school to prison pipeline and what we could do potentially in the future. So I'm sure you've heard this over the last couple of days about what's neurodiversity. So some of it I'll click through relatively quickly. So neurodiversity is the way we all think, move, act and process information and communicate differently. We're all neurodiverse. Some of us diverge from social norms. This is no more pertinent to talking about the justice system, who people are left out of the opportunities to engage in society. Clearly, we see that people don't fit in boxes, and this is going to become more apparent as we look at the data this morning, this afternoon. And neurodiversity is not one condition or defined by a tick list, which is going to be really important to consider in the justice setting. People don't often come with a label or maybe miss or misunderstood, and you're going to see this in more detail. And more than anything, people often go round systems that don't recognise their neurodiversity, and they end up being missed, misdiagnosed or misunderstood. The other challenge we've got, that's why I like the neurodiversity framing, is an opportunity for a shared language, is the terms often mean different things to different people, different professionals, and end up in data and support confusions. And I think this is why we're going to be showing you this. So if you've heard me speak before, you've seen the balls in the bucket. If you haven't, um, I'm just presenting really in a way, how do we sort out the complexity when we're thinking about different cognitive profiles? And often the people who get a diagnosis traditionally have to be bad enough to meet a diagnostic threshold. What this means is a number of people who don't meet that classical, you have to define this narrow box. So if this is blue balls and it's dyslexia, you've got to meet that diagnostic threshold. And people who don't fit that classic parameters then get missed out. And we've seen this very much in the justice setting that a lot of people have a mixed pattern of cognitive profiles that may not fit into ADHD or developmental language disorder or dyslexia in a classical way. And often are the people who miss out altogether on help and support to be their best selves. We've classically looked at these things in boxes and we've looked at dyslexia as a construct or autism as a construct or developmental language as a construct. And in fact, the reality for that is that people don't fit in these neat boxes. And if you want research papers, I'll send you oodles of references for this. This is not my work. It's, it's, it's along with many, many other people over the last 20 years, which really show the reality is, is that people don't fit into these narrow boxes. For instance, four and five people who are autistic have de developmental coordination disorder. One in three people with DCD have ADHD. One in five people with ADHD have a tick disorder and so on. And so those bo the balls in reality, people don't fit in those narrow, narrow categories. And you're going to see this is so important when we're thinking about the people we're going to be talking about and the, and the, the, the data we're going to show you. The other thing is that I think is really important, the labels we're given in may be dependent on the doors we've gone through now or in the past, and you're going to see how relevant this is when Hope presents the data. But actually, that you are, if you're out of a system, that you're less likely to get a diagnosis of a neurodivergent trait or condition because you're not engaging in those professionals who would classically deliver those diagnoses. Um, so we can engage in different services and um, we're really interested in how do we change the direct trajectory so we don't have this potential school to prison pipeline that often exists. 
um, and really thinking about upstream about what we can do, those who are at risk of exclusion, those who have been excluded, those who have got to a PRU, those who are engaging with the justice system, and often that first engagement is with police and then the courts. And we really need to be thinking about the ecosystem all the way along, but how do we change it upstream to make a difference? So what do we know? We're focusing today very much on exclusion because we see this as a key time where actually upstream we can make a potential difference. And what we know is about two out of three males in prison have been excluded from school, so missed out on education. About 0.1% of the population have been excluded from school. So you can see the data is vastly different. And many st studies have found a link between school exclusion and later arrest, and people have used this term, the school to prison pipeline. 77% of children in PRUs have a special educational need, but the challenge has often been that they've been viewed through a behaviour lens, and they've been given the title of social and emotional mental health, and we haven't sort of said, but what is behavior? Behavior is never a diagnosis. It's an expression of, of communication need or other needs, that, uh, but we've used this SEMH framing very much. And the Timpson review that was reported in 2019 found that despite this high rate, special educational needs, or we're talking about the neurodiversity, neurodivergent framework are undiagnosed amongst excluded children. So we recognize they're getting into exclusion, we're not recognizing why they've got there. So we wanted to think about neurodivergence in prisons and about one in two people in prison have a reading age of eight years and are functionally illiterate. These are stark contrasts in where we are. And about one in three prison, uh, Susie Young and others did a, a review of the prevalence data of ADHD in prison populations. A number of people have done this. But we're talking about at least 30% of people have ADHD traits. And if we think about it as a marker of and these markers of functional engagement, I'll come back to that as we go through, and that in ADHD, you've got early offending by about two and a half years. About one quarter of people in prison have an IQ under 80. I, I think that IQ is a very narrow construct because it doesn't really reflect the functional impact day to day of individuals' lives. So if we don't support people who are with neurodiverse traits, there are long term outcomes that are expensive. We're losing skills. We're losing people who, are who end up being unemployed, have higher rates of substance misuse have greater rates of things like accidents, use of A&E, uh, relationship breakdowns, homelessness, and as you can see, at least one in three entering the criminal justice setting. And we see that's a huge loss to society and a burden. But what we recognize, and I think this is really important today, if we're gonna try and capitalize on people's strengths, there are social biases in the current system which result in people being missed again and again and again. You're less likely to have a neurodiversity diagnosis if you've got adverse childhood, uh, uh, um, ACEs president, you've been excluded from school, which we're going to show you in a moment, looked after children, lower SES. People who are out of systems, who are moving around systems, who are homeless, are less likely to get diagnoses but are more likely to be neurodivergent and they're likely to be missed because we have, a so, we have a social inequity there. So we know that children in low income households are more likely to have cognitive deficits, working memory and language skills compared to children in middle income. So again, poverty has got to play in the exclusion of people gaining that diagnosis and free school meals correlates to levels of neurodivergent traits. And I think lastly, the females, we're seeing growing numbers of individuals that have been captured who had been diagnosed later in life because we were looking very much through a predominantly male lens of this is what it looked like, ADHD looked like, or autism looked like, and we were looking through a male lens. So I don't apologize for this slide it's <laughs> because it is about that intergenerational adversity, but cumulative adversity, that if you come from a family who are neurodivergent with less opportunity, less likely to get a diagnosis, you're more likely to have uh, disengagement with, disenfranchisement with employment, um, related to debt, poverty, poorer nutrition. And we can't strip these apart and say neurodiversity is nice and clean over here and not think about epigenetic cumulative adversity and also the, the genes that are running through families, but maybe the stigma of not being able to be diagnosed, uh, not knowing you have a neurodivergent trait and not having the opportunity to gain that diagnosis as well. 
So we've really got to think about, we can't think about these in nice neat boxes in a way. So I'm just going to tell you about Do It Profile and then I'm going to hand over to Hope to present the data to you as well. We've been using Do It Profiler for nearly 10 years in prisons. We've got data, large data sets and we've screened tens of thousands of individuals. It's an, a web, it's an established evidence-based neurodiversity screening tool and it's been used in YOIs and STCs as well. The, the modules we use in the justice setting have been designed for justice and for court to probation. It's not a tick box exercise, which is really important. We're trying to think about the functional implications of that individual. How do we help and support them? And it generates practical guidance. But it also collects the, the macro data capture, which we're going to report on, which really I think you're going to be alarmed and alerted to. And we publish the research findings. So classically, what actually happens if we take 10 people and we think of the statistics, we say 30% of people are neurodivergent, uh, so many people are looked after, so many people are excluded, so many people are homeless, so many people have literacy difficulties. But if you take this first column, that's one person who might have all of those. But often we're talking about people with and not thinking about the cumulative adversity of one person or another. So the profile is screens for background relevant information. So we want to know about people's past, present, to think about them in context. They undertake the neurodiversity screener and there's a co cognitive screener which aligns to IQ roughly, but it's around face validity. It's called the CAS and looks at things like numeracy, literacy, ability to manage money, to tell time, to read instructions, which are going to be so relevant to somebody if they're trying to navigate through the justice setting. And we also think we've got well-being as well. Um, so it's also accessible. So it's got, uh, it's because a lot of people, as we said, can't read um, and can't, uh, and so it's translatable to multiple languages um, and has got accessible features in it and generates reports straight away. The CAS, which um, Hope's going to talk a little bit about in a moment, is that functional screener. We're looking at basic skills that are related to everyday function in everyday life. And what we can see already is that when we look at CAS scores and um, individuals in, the just in this cohort we're looking at, they are worse in individuals who are looked after. So those, and when we look at things like reading skills, worse than in the in, uh, looked after distinct groups, and there are no neat boxes. So we see that screening in isolation, if you're only asking questions about neurodiversity and not thinking about that broader concept of the individual, we're going to miss out completely. So I'm going to hand over to, we're going to try and see, could you give Hope the uh, screen? To, and I shall stop sharing. And we're going to slickly hand over now, we hope. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. <laughs> Trying to make sure this is as smooth as possible. But um, yeah, so hopefully you can see my slides now. Uh, and I will pick up where Amanda just left off. Um, so as um. Amanda alluded to, we'd like to present some findings today from our study about school exclusion. Um, and these findings are from data we've collected in Park Prison, which is in Wales. Um, and these are findings that we're preparing for submission currently, so they're not published anywhere. Um, and so for that reason, are a bit preliminary as well. Um, so our outcome of interest in this study was younger convictions. Um, we know from the literature that being convicted at a younger age um, is criminogenic, so it's a predictor of later justice system contact. We know that it leads to more reoffending or cyclical offending, um, and then also poor outcomes in terms of mental health. Um, it compounds problems with family and peers, and that these effects are all worse the younger you are when you're first convicted. So that's the outcome that we were really focused on in this population. Um, and we wanted to ask three important research questions. So firstly, whether school exclusions are associated with being convicted at an earlier age amongst adults in prison. Um, secondly, whether referral to a PRU, so that's a pupil referral unit um, for anybody who's not familiar with the term, um, whether that amplifies risks above normal exclusion where somebody just spend time at home. Um, so pupil referral units referrals are indicative of sort of a more severe form of exclusion. Children can be referred there for it's like short-term placements or long-term placements, and they can be full or part-time, but they do represent spending time away from mainstream school, um, often for long periods of time or, or complete permanent exclusions. 
Um, so finally, we also wanted to ask how neurodisability impacts age of first conviction and whether school exclusion plays a role in that relationship. So our sample um, was just over 3,000 convicted male adults um, in Wales. They completed the JIT profile as part of their usual practice in Park Prison, um, sort of in the first few weeks of arrival there. Um, we found that 65% of the sample have been excluded from school at least once. Um, so as I touched on before, uh, our outcome of interest is age at first conviction here, and that was retrospectively reported um, by our participants. So it's known in the literature, as Amanda said, that multiple school exclusions confer a greater risk of later arrest. Um, so our findings show that those who've been excluded from school once, two or three times or four or more times, were first convicted three, five and six years younger than their counterparts who'd never been excluded retrospectively. Um, so that's a statistically significant finding and we thought it was a really quite striking finding. Um, and it's worth noting as well that all our analysis controlled for current age, which was really important because the justice system and exclusion policies have changed over the lifespans of these prisoners who were between 18 and sort of 70 ish years old. Um, so just to show you this um, visually, uh, we think this graph is really um, striking as well. So you can see along the bottom are the interval age bands collected for the age at first conviction. So before the age of 12, between 12 and 13, 14, 15, 16 and 18, 19 and 24, and 25 and older. Um, and to draw your attention to the sort of colour chart at the bottom there, you can see that it shows you the proportion of each age band who were excluded from school, never, once is that sort of light grey, two to three times that medium grey, and then four or more times that really dark grey. So what you can see here is that the majority of those who were convicted before the age of 12 um, were excluded from school four times or more and that that darker colour gets smaller as we go through the older first convictions and those who were convicted at 25 or older the majority of them had never been excluded from school so this really illustrates to you how school exclusion is um, a risk factor for these really early convictions which are potentially more harmful uh, we also wanted to look at the people referral unit uh, referral so we found that Children who, sorry, adults who are in prison who'd spent time in a PRU as children were first convicted six years younger than those who'd never been excluded at all, and two years younger than those who'd been excluded but never spent time in a PRU. Um, so, in line with our sort of hypotheses, the PRU referral is conferring additional risk of early, of early convictions, um, and it represents a more severe form of exclusion. And th there's lots of lots of reasons behind this that we haven't really got time to go into. Um, in this presentation, but it indicates that PRUs are an important place for prevention and intervention to happen. Um, and Amanda and I have got some more research going on at the moment in this field, so definitely watch this space for, for more um, findings about PRUs. Um, so finally, bringing neurodisability into the picture, we screened for those functional skills on the CAS, which we used as a proxy for neurodiversity. As Amanda said, that's a really functional screener for everyday skills that people need to navigate life and the justice system. Um, we found that a one standard deviation decrease in score on the CAS, so being one standard deviation below the mean score there, meant being half a year younger at first conviction. Um, so that's, again, a really big, important finding. And then we found that this relationship was um, partially mediated by school exclusion. So what we found specifically is that school exclusion explains 50%, so half of this effect, of neurodisability on age of first conviction. Um, and we think that's just such an important story. So the children with neurodisability are being convicted earlier anyway, but half of that relationship um, is being explained by school exclusion in a sample of convicted adults. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to do more work in this area. Um, as Amanda touched on before as well, we did look at looked after children in neurodisability. Um, so we wanted to really understand this vulnerable population um, who are in prison as adults but were looked after when they were children. There's lots of emerging evidence globally that looked after children have higher rates of diagnosed neurodisability. So we wanted to look at this um, when screen trans diagnostically on this um, do it screener. So we measured the CAS as well as four functional self-report domains. So reading and numeracy, 
social and communication skills, attention and concentration, and physical coordination in order to capture those sort of domains that we often see in people with neurodisability. Um, and these were designed sort of transdiagnostically, again, avoiding those diagnostic thresholds and silos. Um, so we found, as Amanda alluded to, that the looked after children in prison schools significantly worse on all of these measures than the adult prisoners who were never looked after as children. Um, so in these graphs, you can see the mean is the circle with the 95% confidence intervals as the blue lines, and then the median score is the square. Uh, so you can see there's you know blue sky between these um, scores for those in prison who were not looked after, that group one along the bottom, and those in prison who were looked after, group two there. So just to come back to that sort of ecosystem slide that Amanda showed you, it's really important to note that th these are points at which children can have negative experiences that lead them to end up in prison, but they're also opportunities for prevention and intervention. So prevention being preferable, but um, the earlier in this pathway we can do that, the better. So children at risk of school exclusion and who are being referred to a PRU, um, and then all the way through these are points of potential prevention. Um, so there's lots of places we can initiate real change in these pipelines. Um, we do advocate for transdiagnostic screening to make sure no one's missed, um, just because they don't hit the threshold for one particular diagnosis and then miss out on a pathway. Um, and we'd like to see also improved training programmes for staff throughout these systems to help them understand neurodiversity. Um, and lots of research sort of highlights the damaging experience of neurodivergent children in custody. The specialist support for children in school is really important to prevent them. Um, ending up there and supporting teachers to make meaningful relationships with children as well, um, where the vulnerability is really understood as opposed to just seeing behaviour as a diagnosis. Um, so just very briefly as well, we know that prison settings are often challenging, so busy and noisy wings, cell sharing changes to routine, and that neurodivergent people have worse outcomes there in terms of uh, higher levels of restraint, bullying, feeling scared, and the poor mental health outcomes. And that interventions aren't really currently designed for neurodiverse people. Um, they're often based on cognitive behavioural therapy techniques that focus on acceptance of personal responsibility for offending. Um, and this isn't really appropriate for people with neurodiverse conditions who would often benefit a lot more from programmes that teach coping strategies or self-regulation skills um, rather than this sort of acceptance. And as a result of that, again, that rehabilitation isn't happening and we're finding people being trapped in a castle web or a cycle of reoffending. Um, I won't go into detail about this because Nathan's about to speak on this later this afternoon, but um, Professor Nathan Hughes uh, recently published this paper talking about the difficulties of ensuring the rights of children with developmental disabilities within child justice systems. So definitely recommend going to that talk. Um, and we know that prisons are just not the right place for these children to be. Um, so I'll leave you with some thought points because I know we're a little bit over time. So um, uh, we need data to inform future planning. We need better key worker and staff conversations, avoiding rapid siloed screening and implementing screening for all um, who are at risk of exclusion with consistent language, consistent constructs. And that will have a really positive effect on safer custody, violence reduction, positive impact on education, employment, um, really across the board. So. I'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much for listening. And Amanda and I would really love to take any questions you have if we have time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amanda and Hope. That was absolutely fascinating. You galloped through so well. <laughs> Tried to keep to time. Thank you so much. Um, so there are some great questions and um, comments in the chat. Kim's asking about the 300 million turnaround fund that's been announced today by the UK government. Um, how might that help people? What would you do with the money apart from skip the country and enjoy it? <laughs> Uh, um, I, I mean, I do think we've got to think about when we're getting this data and we've got other data sets to reinforce this, that we've got to start earlier, you know, and so we've got to start upstream. Um, you know, it's a waste of talent when you've got people who are ending up in the criminal justice system who we know we've got the data, we know are, you know, have got complex needs. We need to create an ecosystem, but we've got to. Um, some of the work we've been doing with, with the police about first engagement um, I was talking with Barris, Barris's group last night, and you just think the understanding of accessibility um, it, of the court's police engagement uh, in, it, in it, uh, PRUs and those at risk of exclusion, we know who they are, we, we need to get intervention upstream. So that has to be where we start to change the trajectory, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Hope, or we should probably... 
They're happy to take another question. That's good. Great. Um, and Kim Turner has also asked, how does the profiler work with the mandatory chat um, screen in custodial settings? Um, I've done a review, so I can share that with you if you want me to. Um, um, but I, th I think the, the important thing, the difference with the Do It Profiler is that we're assessing and we're generating guidance straight away. So we're providing practical guidance for the staff on how to help support at, at an individual level and the individual to be helped as well. And it's got functional skills as well, assessments in it. And so it's taking a biopsychosocial approach. So I can give more information to Kim Shawns. It sounds like it's got more steps to it. It's it's not just it's, the screening. It, it's not just it isn't it isn't. It's it's gathering information, yes, but it's providing, generates a report straight away for that individual and resources for them. So it's giving you, it's starting the process of intervention. Yep. So practical outcomes as well as as well as the screening. Thank you, Amanda. Um and Melanie Jameson, I think, um, has said we know about bad outcomes um oh, that's just a comment actually not a question i beg your pardon um who do we need to persuade i think she's asking you need to keep i mean it, we've, we've had the coats review we just had the prison education review you know that's out again um we're hearing again and again this is bad stuff we you know we need to keep saying it we've got the evidence for it but again i think neurodiversity as a framing is the common language bit will help to sort of say, it's not about one thing or another, it's about people. Who do we need to influence? Anybody who's listening here to tell other people and government to make sure that we don't work in silos. I mean, that's the problem are, you know, is where the money is spent, it's often in silos rather than across professions. Yeah, yeah. so better, better joint working, perhaps, Amanda. Thank you, yes. Um, anything you want to add, Hope? Um, I think we've had all the questions. Um, actually, the QA function, I think somebody's asking, what, how do we define school exclusion? Does it include anyone who hasn't attended for various reasons? So in our study, we define school exclusion as to people who've been permanently or fixed term excluded from school. So rather than non-attendance or truancy or anything like that, this is actual exclusion from school policy. Thank you. That was for Mary Cashin. She asked that question. Um, very nice presentation. So Jogiel, I don't know if that's a, um, your name or nickname. Forgive me. Um, nice presentation. Would you have any recommendations how school could accommodate students with difficult behaviour? Uh, yeah. <laughs> First is not seeing behaviour as difficult. Behaviour is complex and we don't understand it. So changing the framing is that behaviour is a form of communication saying there is a need. So I think what we need to do in school is to provide training for teachers to understand uh, what that might be and to raise awareness around neurodiversity as maybe one of the reasons. We can't focus high rates of ADHD, high rates of DLD in youth justice, for instance, developmental language disorder. If you don't understand what's going on, you, will, you may misbehave and not be able to focus. So teacher training, um, screening for those who are at risk of, of exclusion. Um, and we've got a study going, we're gonna present data in a couple, when that's finished uh, to show really the high rates of complexity. So understanding those children who are looked after, look, uh, learners of concern that we need to intervene early. Brilliant, thank you, thank you, Amanda. Um, and June has asked um, something about terminology. Should we be talking about um, seeing as there are so many people, so many children, 4,000 who re-enter care, should we be talking about care experienced children rather than looked after children? I don't know if you, either of you have a view on that. I, I just think looked after is interesting because often they're not being looked after. So, so in care, we're often care less than careful. So I just think we need to think about, so maybe children of great need, greater need or or, or children we love, <laughs> you know, we should love. You know, I think I think the terminology is an interesting one. Thank you. Yeah, probably a bigger subject than we can perhaps go into today. But uh, how do we get school to implement disabled needs accommodations, Carol? So I, from Carol, she's also asking. I think we covered that a little bit. Um, but again, that's possibly one that's a bit too complex to go into in tons of depth, as it tends to be different for different children doesn't it um and it's not one size fits all so um anything else you wanted to say hope or amanda before we move on to our next speakers no thank, thank you, you. Thank you.
thank you so much for keeping yeah, brilliantly for to time me. thank you very much for coming we really appreciate it and um and next we're going to go straight on going to jump straight into our next wonderful speakers we have with us Stephen Dedridge and Ryan Francis and I'll introduce you to them in just a second Stephen is the quality manager for the National Autistic Society's autism accreditation program Stephen is a passionate believer in ensuring that autistic people get quality support to help them overcome discrimination uh, in regards to being autistic. He was responsible for creating the standards framework for prisons, seeking accreditation in good practice in supporting autistic inmates. Stephen's also a passionate believer in ensuring that autistic people get that quality support um, that they are not getting in all sorts of different situations. He's carried out assessments in Park Prison and Feltham Young Offenders Institute. So that's Stephen and I'll, he will say hello in a minute. And we also have Ryan Francis, who is a senior operational manager at Her Majesty's Prison and Youth Offender Institute Park Prison in Bridge End, South Wales. Ryan's worked at the prison for almost 15 years and was the senior manager and project lead for, and it's a Welsh word that I can't pronounce, CYNWYS, C Y N W Y S unit, forgive my absolute ignorance of Welsh, um, which means inclusion in Welsh. And that was recognised as best practice by Her Majesty's Inspector of Prisons after a recent inspection. HMP and YOI Park has been awarded advanced accreditation status by the National Autistic Society for its work supporting autistic prisoners. In doing so, HMP Park has become the first prison in England and Wales to be, to be awarded advanced status. So a very big warm welcome to both of you. Over to you. Thank you very much. I'm just hoping that I can share my screen. Yes, I hope you've got the technology working for you. Yes, this is always <laughs> the most scary bit of presentations is. now, isn't it? Yeah, everybody yeah. talk amongst themselves as we yes, yes, yes. try to make it work. Is that working for you? Wait a minute, it looks like it should work. Good, good. Yeah, is it it's coming through. Oh, yeah. is it? Oh, brilliant. We've got it. Oh, excellent. That's right. I can relax now. That's the most scariest part now of, of presentations I find now is the actual dreaded will the presentation work. So I'm pleased about that. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as you explained, I'm the quality manager for autism accreditation. Um, and I'll spend just around about 10 minutes just talking to you about um, the accreditation program and how we've worked with the prisons. And then Ryan will. Um, we're very fortunate that Ryan's here, as, as you explained, um, how highest award you can give within the accreditation programme is advanced award. And, and, and we're, I'm really pleased that Ryan's joined us today from Park Prison to talk about the work that they do. So um, autism accreditation has been running since 1992. Um, it was set up as quality assurance programme. I think it's always been about changing practice. People get a, a, an award, they get a nice certificate, they get a nice badge, they can put on their letterheads. But I think we've always been motivated by the idea that this is about um, change and this is about making things better for autistic people. And we've worked with schools and, and other services for, um, as I say, for a, quite a long period of time. Our involvement in prisons is relatively a new thing, and it really started in around about um, 2015. Um, and, and initially it was work that we did with Felton Prison, work with Felton Young Offenders, who, who we realised, who approached us very much with the interest of wanting to work with the National Autistic Society. And also because it came at a time where we were increasingly aware of the need that there was autistic people in prison, and those autistic people were struggling and so were the staff who were there to support them. So we saw that there was a very clear need for us to um, do this piece of work. I'm gonna rush through the next slides because I get the impression from listening to the last speaker and perhaps earlier in the day, and uh, you know, the, these are topics that will be covered in quite a lot of depth. But I mean, one of the questions that we often get asked is how many autistic people are there in prison? And um, we know it's um, one in a hundred in the general population. Um, the answer to that question is we don't know. There's various studies that produce different outcomes. Uh, one of the big issues that's been, been identified is there's no standardized screening for autism. Um, and 
even if somebody's recognized as being autistic in a prison, if they show autistic traits um, and say the learning disability nurse, uh, the nursing team would like to refer them for diagnosis um, without you know, being um, too, too cynical. The, the person may well have finished their sentence before they get the diagnosis. And I think there's definitely evidence just that um, a large number of people who are autistic who enter into prison haven't got a diagnosis or been given another diagnosis, maybe have been misdiagnosed. Um, I just wanted to um, shout out this, doc, the, 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 this publication that's come out quite recently and is linked with the Joint um, Inspection um, Report, which is, very good, in, you know, good read because it it looks at the expenses, the lived expenses of autistic people and other neurodiverse people, and it really gives an insight into how, why, however many autistic people there are in prison, why they they experience so much disadvantage. And you know, as as a previous speaker, you know, it was fascinating listening to the previous speaker, and I think they've already touched on some of these issues around why prison is just such a challenge for autistic people. We know that autistic people have extreme high levels of anxiety compared to uh, the majority of the population. And for anybody going into a prison, it's an anxious experience, it's a very stressful experience. This is multiplied um, with it for, for, for autistic people, sensory issues, communication issues, and it all can end up in an autistic person being perceived as having challenging behaviour, being aggressive, being awkward, being rude. And then before you know it, they're being treated in terms of sanctions and punishments. Um, so the standards themselves, I think we realised quite early on in the process that we needed to look at custody and care alongside health and alongside um, the teaching of skills. So the, the, the standards are divided into those three sections. Um, the standards have gone through various versions. And I think the biggest change that we've made in the standards, and I think the biggest thing for me working in prisons is awareness of the importance of those people who are prison officers. Um, the, in, in some prisons, it's seen that this is, you know, or, so if there's training about autism or whatever, it's directed to the mental health team or the learning disability team. But the people that are actually at the front line are providing 24-7 care for autistic people in a prison setting are your prison officers. And they're often the last people to get training or recognition in terms of their understanding of autism. So um the how does it work so we have the self-assessment um framework and that seeks to identify what is best practice uh, a prison that signs up to us we ask them to complete the self-assessment framework um and then we arrange an assessment uh, during the assessment we might observe some of the daily activities that happen in the prison observations within a prison setting is often very problematic as much as possible we get a sense of what is the daily life like for some use in, in a prison and how might that relate to some of the challenges they might experience if they're autistic. Um, we look at their support plans for individuals and really important obviously we talk to the staff but we also talk to autistic prisoners themselves and quite often people that are in the role of providing peer support to those prisoners and I think that's probably the most insightful aspect of, of, of our assessment. Uh, a question I think that has emerged from our work, we've now, we're now working for, I think something like 11 prisons have now signed up, um, three of them have got accredited with part now achieving this, this higher level award. Um, are we seeing any patterns? We're, we're recognising that we're working with a very diverse um, range of institutions. We're dealing with young offenders as compared to prisons that are, are, are for adults. We're working in prisons that have different funding channels, um, different category of prisoner. So is there, so, so, and one of our processes is obviously to recognise what makes these provisions different and not have a one size fits all approach. But are there anything that comes out of this process that we could say points to some common links? I think the first thing, and if there's one message that I would want everybody to take from this, is that 
addressing uh, supporting autistic people within a prison setting is a whole prison responsibility. And as I said before, sometimes it becomes seen as the responsibility of, of like I say, mental health or, or disability, um, rather than it needs to be seen about a whole prison approach. Training. I think it's very easy to say that um, people that work in prisons need training about autism. I mean, we, we, that's recognised. But I think we need to look at what kind of training it is, because it needs to be training that's rooted in an understanding of the context. And it needs to be training that empowers um, prison officers and other staff to feel that they are, are in a better position to respond to um, a, a prisoner who's behaving in a certain way. It's not just simply about telling uh, them about, you know, all the problems that autistic people might have. It's about recognizing there's something I can do about it. I, 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 there's things that I can do. There's thing, changes that I can make that are quite simple and I can make those changes. It's also about ongoing su supervision. It isn't about your once, you know, I attended autism awareness training, you know, five years ago, right, we can take that off then. It has to be seen as an ongoing process. It's about making those whole, whole prison adaptations about what will work right across the prison. Um, but it's also recognising that for some individuals, they will need a, a personalised pathway. Um, that pathway needs to start off with screening. As I said, it, it, there's still a large percentage of prisons where there is no clear screening tool for autism or for other new d d d diverse conditions. Um, so it needs to look at the screening, it needs to look at a proper uh, assessment process, and then it needs to look at a, a personal plan that covers um, every aspect of that prisoner's life and identify what adaptations that person requires. And it needs to look at specialist provision, uh, maybe there's a need for I mean, I, I, and Ryan will talk a little bit more about the specialist provision uh, at Park, um, or it might be the case of looking at specialist programs and seeing whether or not there, that there needs to be adapted programs. I've rushed through that because I want to make sure that Ryan ha ha has his opportunity to talk. Um, and obviously, you know, I, I'll be here to answer any questions. Um, if you want to take a note of my email as well, if anybody wants to email me after this event to ask any questions about um, the Autism Preservation Programme, I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah. So I'm hoping Ryan is going to be able to take over now. Is, oh, Ryan. Oh, there's Ryan there. Yeah. So Ryan, I, I, I'm going to um, try and do my technological bit of coming away from this. Okay. And I shall hand over to you, Ryan, yeah? That's great, thank you. Oh, I found the button which says stop sharing. <laughs> over to you, Ryan. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as uh, Stephen said, my name is Ryan Francis. I'm a senior operational manager at uh, HMP Park in uh, Bridgend in South Wales. Um, I've been uh, working in the prison service um, for the last 10, 15 years or so. Um, so I'm hoping I can... Ryan, Hello? so sorry to inter interrupt. I think you're a little bit quiet. I don't know if there's anything you can do to improve the sound. Perhaps that's just for me, but um, the speakers I have been... Speakers are as loud as they can go. Okay, just crank your volume up, folks. Thank you. Okay, let me just uh, see if I can share my screen with you. Hopefully, I'll be able to. Uh, just bear with me for a second. We are having some uh, technical difficulties apart with our IT today. If not, I'll just I'll just talk you through the presentation. If uh, if that's something that would be okay for everybody, I hope, I hope you can all still hear me. Oh, we can hear you. We can see your Gmail. I think. At the moment, Ryan, I don't know if you've got slides you want to share or yeah, something else. Slides I'd like to share with you, but it's um, unfortunately not playing not playing ball at the minute. But I will. Uh... Um, I don't know if um, our organisers. We've got a bit of time, so we can juggle this. Um, it's either Beth or Emily. I don't know if you can check permissions. Uh, I know you you can share actually, can't you, Ryan? So it should be yeah, all right. I, I think it's probably our. 
um, IT that's causing the problem more than anything else? Oh, is it? Mm. Um, it's not sharing your slides. If you minimize everything on your screen, are you, are you able to go to your slide, find your slides anyway, or is that not just not going to work for you? That's not going to work, I don't think. Not going to work for you. Oh, I'm sorry. You could always email them to us and we can yeah, try and share them if that's helpful. Yeah, I can forward them through. I've got a print yep. off um, of the site so I can kind of um, read it through with everybody and I can forward you the slides after. Apologies for that. Okay, thank you. So um, as Stephen said, I've, I've worked with Park for um, the best part of 15 years and I was the project lead for our uh, Canice program. Um, so it was the right pronunciation of Canice, which means inclusion in Welsh. So um, I think going back to what Hope and um, Amanda have said previously, um, you know, probably covering kind of the same things is 28 to 30 percent of men in custody have a learning disability or difficulty, and seven percent have an IQ of, um, of under 70. Um, so we recognised that back in um, 2018, and we started um, an assisted living unit on one of our main residential house blocks. And we were lucky enough to achieve accreditation from the um, National Autistic Society to support um men are prisoners with um, autism learning disabilities and brain injuries um so we, it was there was a we identified that um, people with learning disabilities have um you know prisoners are difficult enough place to be at, at the best of times but anybody with um a neurodiverse um kind of problem it, it's more it can be frightening it's a really kind of difficult and, and scary place to be um you know it We've got people, it's, it's not easy to meet sensory needs within a prison. There can be a lack of privacy, um, a lack of engagement from community services, um, you know, lack of support systems where people are without the support systems in the community. Um, there's a lack of that. And a complex prison system in, in just the fact that we are in a prison um, creates barriers to the, the more simple tasks, really. And, the, and we, there was a risk then of exploitation from peers and from other prisoners, um, which resulted in higher percentage of prisoners ending up in segregation, um, being bullied, being victimized, feeling frightened. Um, so we, um, on the back of that, we decided we would want to kind of progress that accreditation from the National Autistic Society and, and see if we could support prisoners um, even further. Um, and we opened um, what was then, well, uh, we redeveloped one of our units into um, the Canice unit. So a Canice uh, development, um, what we kind of said, it wasn't the objective of separating, but we wanted to celebrate people. Um, it's a positive concept, emphasizing an understanding of the social and personal attributes of every individual and enhancing their life chances. Obviously, when they're in, in custody with us and their resettlement needs um, upon release. So we wanted to make sure that we just didn't um, look after uh, our prisoners when they were in our care, but also we were providing them with the best possible outcomes when they were released into the community. Um, we developed then on the back of that an assisted living pathway. Um, so every prisoner who um, comes into park, regardless of where in the prison they live, whether they are a young offender, um, we hold children in park, so um, you know, 15 to 18 year olds or their main location adults, um, everybody receives an induction from our early days in custody team. We then do the do it profiler and a BKS B assessment, which I think Hope and um, Amanda discussed a little bit earlier about what, what that involves. And then that kind of linked into a consideration for our pathway support. Um, we have additional learning needs coordinators, learning disabilities nurses, unit coordinators all on site, um, who then, depending on the, the scores from the BKSB and the DOIT profiler, um, they go out and complete their own assessments. Um, that generated a multidisciplinary team approach. Um, which then, if there was anybody identified as needing any assistance because of a neurodiverse need, autism, learning disability, or brain injury, um, that that generated a multidisciplinary approach, which then linked in, I think as Stephen's already said, to a whole prison approach, which is the, the key to um, uh, the success that we've had with the National Autistic Society and the success of Canice Unit. Um, so we needed to make sure that when we started this project, we had the, the buy-in of the whole prison. Um, from our education team to um, outside services, and by that I mean um, kind of people's first, offender, offender management teams, probation, training providers, um, and, and any kind of stakeholders from the community would kind of buy into, into the project we were trying to, to kind of get up off the ground really. So from an operational perspective, um, we employed complex needs support workers. 
um, uh, Canos Unit has his own team of coordinators. We got an early days in custody team, um, fend management in custody team um, workers as well. And we had the support of our healthcare team, our safer custody team, our healthcare team, um, which included learning disabilities nurses and mental health nurses. Um, on our education team, so we were able to employ and provide an additional learning needs coordinator, ALN teachers, and the Shannon Trust scheme. Um, that generated a whole prison approach um, with a multidisciplinary kind of case management model. But the outcome of that multidisciplinary work, working was to provide um, an, uh, an independent plan and a person-centered plan, which was kind of critical um, to the success. So the buy-in we had of everybody developed plans for people, education plans, resettlement plans. So everybody that was on our program knew exactly what the support was, where it was coming from. And there was an element of accountability and responsibility for all the stakeholders to provide the support that our prisoners needed. Um, we made positive changes um, on the back of the multidisciplinary working. Um, so we made changes, um, reasonable adjustments to thing like, things like the, our incentives and earned privileges scheme, which allows prisoners to access different incentives in the prison, um, kind of different amount of um, spends, access to better jobs, um, access to more money and to better visits and different times in the gym. Um, so we, we worked around our IEP scheme then to make sure we made the reasonable adjustments to those who had neurodiverse needs were um, able to engage in that regime more appropriately. Um, we worked with outside agencies, um, training providers, prison staff, healthcare professionals. Um, we developed behavior management plans. We have achievement ceremonies once a month where we, um, we bring everybody together um, for somebody who's, who's achieved. Um, it, to us, you know, might be something really small. Um, to, to somebody who is in our care with a neurodiverse need, it might be that they've um, they've managed to access an, a higher level of the IEP scheme for a period of time. So we would achieve, we would make sure we, we recognize that success and we would have achievement ceremonies. They were kind of regularly attended by our senior management team, by our director and our deputy director. And we would have kind of buffets and presentation ceremonies and we would award certificates and so on. Um, so we kind of progressed that to our Canos unit. And then last year we applied for um, the advanced accreditation from the National Autistic Society, um, which at the time no prison in England and Wales had been fortunate enough, fortunate enough to achieve. Um, it was, I would say, probably four years in the making um, of a lot of hard work by everybody that I've, um, I've, I've just mentioned. Um, we applied for the, um, the accreditation and we were lucky enough to, to be awarded it, making us the, the first prison in England and Wales to, to, rec to be recognised at that level by the National Autistic Society. Um, we've got some, you know, indicators of the success. So the, the, the prisoners who were located across um, our Canois unit, um, we saw 70%, 76 percent decrease in our self harm amongst our population. We saw a 32 percent decrease in um, incidents, violent incidents among the population, and we saw a 19 percent decrease in our use of force amongst our population. Um, the one thing that we did see was um, an increase in was in complaints um, from, from prisoners, but we saw that as a positive step, as in prisoners felt they were um, supported enough to be able to make the complaints if they thought something wasn't right, where previously um, they may have just sat back and, and kind of accepted what was happening. Um, so we saw the increase in complaints from prisoners within that group um, as a really positive thing. They felt more kind of, um, allowed and supported to make a complaint if they thought something wasn't wasn't right. Um, so we've got an you know, ongoing project really of, of Canais and Park Prison in general of how we support our population. Um, we want to look at more sensory improvements. We've recently employed um, an oc occupational therapist who's got a background in learning disabilities and autism. Um, our new wing has opened. Um, we've got a sensory garden. We have a sensory room. Um, we've got healthcare autism assessors, so our healthcare team are now um, qualified to diagnose um, autism. 
uh, I said we've got a sensory garden um, and a sensory pathway, and we're trying to roll that out further now across the prison. Um, and kind of, kind of before I finish, um, a, you know, a recognition of the achievement that we've managed to, to go to a park. Um, so in 2012, which is where we started, really, we launched the first learning disabilities pathway. Um, and then a year later, which is, you know, really quickly, the Butler Trust recognised our team for transforming the management and care of prisoners with learning disabilities at Park. Um, we then extended that provisional across our vulnerable persons unit. And then, as I said, in 2018, we were awarded the accredited status by the National Autistic Society. Um, Can I opened in 2019? Um, and in 2020, the Manchester Probation and Prison Service, um, LDD services, um, recognised Park as best practice and a point of excellence for neurodiverse prisoners. That was in um, our recent uh, the inspection by Your Majesty's Inspector of Prisons. Um, so 2020, Royal College of Nursing awarded us for um, our work with learning disabilities and we were awarded a Royal College of Nursing Award to the healthcare team of Park. Um, but the Trust Award was given to our additional learning needs team within the prison. Um, and then the first Inspire Award was granted to Park, which was last year for services to neurodiversity. diversity. And then at the end of last year, we kind of achieved what we wanted to, which was to be awarded the advanced accreditation from the National Autistic Society. Um, our work continues, we're kind of not standing still. I know that uh, hope is still on, hope has visited, visited us as is Amanda. So we still got plenty of things we want to achieve and, and we want to take things further, but that's kind of where we are at the minute. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Ryan um, and and Stephen, and for sharing that that story of what you've what you've done. And congratulations on the all the awards and so on. Um, we've got some great questions in the chat. Um, people are really keen to know more. Uh, let me go to the chat first. Um, so, uh, people, a lot of love for what you're doing ultimately if only the government would learn from this and expand it so that might be a good question actually is is how can we expand this across the whole prison estate and i don't know if you or stephen have any thoughts about that i, I can answer steve if, if if you like I, I think the key to it as a, i think stephen um touched on it earlier as, as did i is it the whole is a is a whole prison approach mm -hmm. that is the key to this the success is kind of driven from the top down and the bottom up so you know it, we, we've recently started to have um, referrals into our Canos unit from other prisons, so not just other departments across Park and, you know, prisoners can self-refer to Canos, families can refer, um, education can refer, operational staff, healthcare, anybody can refer in. Um, so we've kind of driven that out right across Park where there is, you know, um, a, a real simple referral system. There's an email, it is simple as a group email. Um, I think we have managed to get it that it is a whole prison approach but i think that the, the success is it has to it has to be driven from the top down and the bottom up it is it, yeah. it, it doesn't work otherwise it, it, if it's if it's if you try to do it in isolation it doesn't work got to get everybody on board by the sounds of it yeah Absolutely. brilliant thank you very much yeah i would just yeah. add so i was going to say that when you look at park success um, I think for some other prisons, it's a ten, it can feel a bit scary and people can say, well, we'll never get there. And I'm sure Ryan will support me in saying it didn't happen overnight in Park. You know, there is, this is a process that's taken years. And I've seen myself, you know, how things have developed over the years with Park. So I would say start off, you know, doing what you can achieve and see or build upon that rather than just simply say we're never going to be like park therefore it's not worth even trying sounds like a sort of iterative approach rather than yes. being you know how do you eat the elephant in bite-sized chunks where do we where do we start <laughs> kind of thing yeah fantastic thank you or the vegetarian option <laughs> <laughs> or the veg other options apply yeah. yeah thank you um and other other people are asking similar questions um whether you work with other prisons who want to do similar and and what what you might do but i think you might covered that a little bit um i don't know if you want to say more on that or yeah we, I, I think as i just touched on we we mm. had visits from other prisons to come in and see what we do um other healthcare departments in particular and as i said we have started now to have um referrals into kind of senior from other prisons as well even as far away as feltham in london where people have kind of got to hear what we do and and have, have Kind of email and say how do we refer how do i get you know how do we access this kind of support and you know, i think a good example of that is we had a referral from swansea prison um and 
for the the prisoner who met the kind of need of can ice and and needed our support we drove to swansea we kind of bypassed the the traditional kind of transfer process if you like we went we met him we introduced ourselves we agreed the time he would be transferred to park in a, in a taxi um so we, you know there was no kind of the, the the usual kind of wagon up and down the motorway that you see um we bypassed the admissions process we bypassed the induction process we brought him straight mm-hmm. on the canos unit and we did his induction and his admission process while he was on the unit so to try and bypass the, the the more difficult units and you know what can be really as i said a really kind of difficult and frightening time so we will make adjustment to new admissions coming into park if we think they need the support of canos unit as well brilliant making those sensitive adjustments Absolutely. by the sounds of it yeah really really very important thank you um somebody who's asking in the chat sylvia sylvia is asking whether you might employ speech and language therapists as part of, part of your multidisciplinary teams Yes, that is something we are, we are looking at. We've, we started with an occupational therapist and um, we just finished and developed now um, a sensory garden to go along with our sensory room. Um, so we employed our, our OT to kind of work out there, but speech and language is absolutely something we're looking at as well. We do refer out to speech and language therapies. We haven't got anybody on site, um, but we do refer out for SALT assessments. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And I don't know, Sylvia, if you if you want to get in touch, um, we can share contact details if you if you'd like to talk more. Um, we've got lots of lots of questions in the Q&A section um, within the FASD. So that's fetal alcohol syndrome community. We recognize the overlapping characteristics between FASD and, and autism and often FASD can be misdiagnosed as autism. Um, is that something a concern that you both share? Um, is that an area for ongoing discussion? Jeff Dunbar's asking that. Do you want me to answer first round? I, yeah. I, th- I mean, obviously I work for the National Autistic Society, so we're looking at this from an autism perspective, mm-hmm. but I actually think people with it need to be less worried about the, the diagnosis as how it affects that individual and what will help that individual, because I think it can sometimes be a diversion. Yeah, as I said, quite a lot of people who come into prison are misdiagnosed. Maybe some of them are misdiagnosed as autistic or they're misdiagnosed as something else. I think the most important thing is identifying what their needs are and addressing those needs for adaptations rather than getting too bogged down in what is the diagnosis. As I said before as well, there's a huge waiting list for prisoners to get the diagnosis. What do you do while you're waiting? You still need need to address those needs so I, my, you know my answer to that question really is prisons need to focus on how somebody presents and what they need to do to address that rather than getting too worried about what is the diagnosis I, I don't know if you want to add anything to that Ryan yeah, I, I agree completely, Stephen. I think it's, it's important to remember that we've got a referral system into part in, on the Canoise unit, um, but you know, but we absolutely will support anybody that we think um, needs that level of support and encouragement and care, um, even if that only is only on a short-term basis while we get them through the kind of difficulties they're going through. So, you know, as much as Canoise was developed to support. Um, prisoners with autism and learning disabilities and brain injury. Um, we are not precious as such, if that's the right word to use, about mm. what kind of lives on there. Um, it is important that we we kind of risk assess who's there as well, because we need to make sure that, that if we do put somebody on there that doesn't kind of necessarily meet that criteria, that it is safe for them and for the prisoners who are on there. Um, so no, it, it, is, it, is, um, it is mandatory that somebody with autism lives on Canice. Absolutely not. And what, you know, what we also provide from the unit is outreach support as well. So if we have got somebody that decides that they don't want to live on Canice, that's absolutely fine. Um, but what we will do, we will try and support them outside of the unit. So our ALN teachers, our unit coordinators, um, our healthcare team will provide outreach support from a person um, centred care plan. Um, so anybody that you know needs the support of the unit can access it anyway. Mm. Sounds like a very person-centred approach by the sounds of it, rather than a diagnostic um, label-led approach. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, We've got a few more questions and we have gone over time, but I know we've got, we have got a bit more time this afternoon because somebody, one of our speakers has sadly dropped out. Um, So Daniela Lobert is asking, what are the most common offences by autistic people? Is it 
impossible to say if they were generally tricked or misled into committing those crimes. I don't know if that's possible for you to comment on. Yes. Brian or Stephen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, well, yeah, sorry, I, 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 um, I, I don't have the statistics, but yeah, there's obviously autistic people are at great risk of being um, exploited. Um, so there's a, a risk of exploitation, um there's a risk of uh, a misunderstanding um in terms of uh maybe an autistic person um getting very anxious about a particular rule or something like that's leading to um them going to prison um so there is another side of this and i do think it's something that we're well within the accreditation um our, our introduction to the criminal justice system really came uh, and it's lovely to see kim commenting so hello Kim <laughs> I haven't seen you for a few years but um you know with, with with our involvement you know the prisons contacts us first there's a huge amount of work that we would like to get involved in around the courts and also with the police to kind of look at why are these you know why are autistic people becoming you know ending up in prisons and is that necessarily where you know because of maybe failings in the criminal justice system um so yeah that that, that yeah. is a concern ryan i don't know you, if you ryan uh, yeah, so, uh, we 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 kind of see um the prisoners of heart and convicted you know uh, lots of different offenses i think it's, it's important to us that um obviously we need to be aware of managing risk um you know if there's a risk to uh, both prisoners to themselves and to others to other prisoners or to staff but I mean, generally, um, unless there is um, there's a, a need for the staff to look in, into any detail of what the offence is, we are more focused on the, the care and support they need as opposed to the reason they're in, they're in custody. And I think the approach from the staff at Park, particularly those on, on Cummins Unit, is very much person-centred and it is very much um, kind of person-led and it is about the care and the support as opposed to the offence. Um, you know, so we, we don't, um, unless we have, absolutely have to, um, we, we don't tend to look too much into people's offences. I mean, that's kind mm -hmm. of our offender management team who would advise, uh, advise us of any risks, um, but we tend to kind of manage the, the, the population. Um, so we don't really, uh, we do uh, look at what people are in custody for, but that's generally looked at by another department. So for, from an operational perspective, um, it is more about the care and the support as opposed to the, to the offence that has led them to be in custody in the first place. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. It sounds like it's an upstream issue, perhaps, and also about when people go back into society of, um, of, of preventing reoffending. And if there are patterns of offending, for particular types of crimes, then knowing about that because it's a sort of safeguarding safeguarding issue, isn't it? Okay, um, June Leet um, asks asks Ryan, when our traumatised adopted young people and young adults enter the criminal justice system, how do we, as loving, caring parents, get their children to be sent to you, um, providing you also understand the ongoing parenting at a distance role that's integral to their well-being and future, and so on. Yeah, good question. So we have, um, as I said earlier, we have a young persons unit at Park, which kind of um, looks after 15 to 18 year old um, prisoners uh, or children, sorry. Um, you know, as I said, there is a referral form, which I'm, I'm happy to kind of share with everybody. Um, so if, if anybody, once they, um, they, they reach the age of 18, if they stay at Park, then they can be referred into uh, Canvas Unit. We regularly have referrals from our young persons unit. Um, I, I think I should also ask that our, our young persons unit is kind of, well, not one of the, it is the best in the country. So there is a similar approach in our young persons unit um, as there is from the staff on Canvas and the rest of the staff who work across the adult estate. Um, it is very kind of person-centered and kind of um, rehabilitative led. Um, so there is there is a link between us and, and so the Canos unit and the young persons unit, but I'd be happy to share um, a, a referral form to Canos uh, along when I share the slides later on. More Thank you. Happy. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I think we probably should move on, I think. Um, uh, somebody's talking about being careful about 
how we attribute neurotypical reasoning to our assumptions about what's behind a crime and so on. So there's there's some really interesting points in the chat, um, but I think we should probably move on to our next speakers. But um, thank you so much, Ryan and Stephen, for your time. I found that personally absolutely fascinating, really fascinating, and it's so important to learn from good practice. So thank you so much for sharing that. We wish you the best um, with, with everything you do next. Thank you.